Hola, ¿qué tal? Y bienvenidos a una nueva charla con Líderes en Salud Global. Hoy nos encontramos en un momento crítico en la historia de la salud. Nos encontramos en la intersección de la medicina y la tecnología. La salud digital y la inteligencia artificial están reconfigurando el panorama de la atención médica, trayendo desafíos significativos, pero también oportunidades sin precedente. Estamos viendo cómo estas tecnologías pueden cambiar la forma en que diagnosticamos, tratamos y prevenimos enfermedades, siempre con el objetivo de mejorar la vida de nuestros pacientes. Sin embargo, debemos garantizar que estos avances también sean accesibles y de beneficio para todos. La pandemia de COVID también ha impulsado aún más el desarrollo y la adopción de soluciones de salud digital y de inteligencia artificial, abriendo un nuevo horizonte de posibilidades, pero también de reflexiones éticas. Y para explorar este fascinante y desafiante mundo, hoy nos acompaña un destacado experto en la intersección de medicina, tecnología y genómica, el doctor Eric Topol, un defensor en la medicina, de la medicina personalizada y la transformación de la atención médica a través de la tecnología. Hi, Dr. Topol, how are you today? I'm well, thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for, for sharing with us this opportunity to talk about digital health and artificial intelligence. Absolutely, my favorite topic, and I'm glad to be with you. Fantastic. Thank you, Professor. Before any question, I would like to start uh, just asking if you could tell us about yourself. Who is Eric Topol and what has been your career path so far? Well, I uh, was interested when I was young in, in genetics, but uh, then I got motivated to become a physician. So then I got all my medical training and became a cardiologist. But uh, later I got back to genetics and realized that alone, even our whole genome sequence would not be enough to understand the uniqueness of each human individual. So that's why I got into digital. And then eventually, uh, genetics and digital data and all the other data about people made me clear, made it clear to me that we can't do this unless we have support with AI. So in the last several years, this has been my main focus is AI in, in medicine and healthcare. I understand. Professor, well, for those, including me, uh, who are not, uh, not familiar with this concept, could you explain what is digital health and how this field and artificial intelligence are changing the landscape of medicine and healthcare? Well, essentially, it, it, it is an outgrowth of a massive amount of data. You know, we, the term we used for many years was big data, but now we have big data at, at an individual level. And no human can assimilate all that, process that, in addition to the corpus of medical knowledge. And that's what's necessary in order to make accurate diagnoses. We already know that machine eyes can be trained far superior to what human eyes can detect in scans and in pictures of uh, various images that we use in, in medicine every day. So we're going to see now with the large language models, a whole new era in healthcare, which is propelled by the superior analytics that we, as humans, things that we can't do very well. Okay. Um, in this context, Professor, what could be the most significant challenges and opportunities that you see in the application of artificial intelligence in health? Right. Well, they're kind of divided by phases. So the short term, we've already seen how you can markedly improve image interpretation, whether it's an X-ray or a CT scan, MRI, across the board, uh, ultrasound. The, the next phase is uh, how we do documentation. So instead of electronic health records where we have to type at keyboards and have a function as a data clerk, for physicians and nurses, this will change. This will be done with synthetic notes that take on all these other tasks which make life easier for physicians and clinicians. But also patients will get more empowered because they will capture their own data and have algorithmic support. But then if you go forward more in time, 
you'll see bigger uh, changes like hospital at home, like digital twins, like a virtual health assistant that is taking all your data and real time processing it to help keep you healthy if you want to use that support. So there's there's really uh, a matter of time how each of these use cases comes into play. We understand. Professor, well, on the other hand, uh, in terms of health equity, how can we ensure that advances in digital health and artificial intelligence are accessible and beneficial to everyone, regardless of their, their location and their socioeconomic status? Right. Well, this is a very big fear that AI could worsen inequities in health. I have already seen some examples where it's doing just the opposite. Uh, perhaps the best example I know is how we have smartphone ultrasound in um, low and middle income countries that is now being used by people with no knowledge of how to do an ultrasound because the AI can guide acquiring the image and do automatic automated interpretation. So we are seeing images of the lungs and the heart and other parts of the body in places in Africa, uh, India, and many other places that otherwise wouldn't be able to do that through a smartphone. And eventually, uh, many other examples of where AI can be used to uh, flatten the, the uh, inequities, to reduce them. I hope we will see that uh, take hold. Of course, do you see any challenge in adoption of this infrastructure and technology in this in these settings? Big challenges, <laughs> big. Uh, first of all, we as uh, doctors in the medical community have a, a very slow uh, movement of change. We, we don't like to change things, uh, which is understandable because it's a very conservative community. But in addition to that, when the AI tools that come about, they're not transparent. We can't see the data that the regulatory body sees, and there's not trust. And a lot of the studies are done that are retrospective, so they're not high quality. And the companies are not transparent because they are saying that their data are proprietary. Yes. So the lack, of, the lack of trust, the lack of publications, the lack of really good validation, uh, and the implementation are all issues. And then in addition, you, you can't just implement one of these uh, algorithms and then just think, oh, everything's great. You have to have it under constant surveillance. So most health systems around the world have not implemented, have not adopted AI yet. Uh, and we are waiting for better trust, for better transparency, for better uh, guidance on implementation. And obviously there's a cost issue, even though this is software, which is added to the problem. Of course, just following one of your, uh, following up with your one of your ideas, what in your consideration? What are the most important ethical uh, issues or considerations that in the use of artificial intelligence in healthcare that we need to to watch today? Just in this transition. Well, you touched on one, which of course is worsening inequities. Um, another is the bias and fairness uh, is a big one because we know that not so much the AI per se, but the data inputs are based on cultural, substantial, profound biases. And we have to always interrogate the data inputs and the algorithm for that possibility. And we have many examples of florid bias. Um, but it's not just that. I would also come back with the way medicine is practiced today. We don't have a real bond between patients and doctors anymore. There's, it's a big business. And it's very short time of any visit or bedside rounds in a hospital because clinicians are squeezed. And I would say that's unethical because that is not the way we should be practicing medicine. We need to have a presence with patients, a trust, uh, a deep 
empathy, exquisite communication, and we don't have that today. So if we don't do something about this, I would say the practice of medicine today, is certainly in the United States, is unacceptable overall. It must be improved. And this is one, it's, this is the only way I know that we could get there. Of course. And just following this idea, doctor, uh, I also see one big difference in generations. For example, those I'm also a physician. Um, I didn't uh, did my medical school. Uh, just I mean, my training is was not focused on in the use of this new technology. However, the mm, current curricula, curricula from medical schools, in, at least in Mexico, they're not considering the use of big data or digital health of, of uh, well, artificial intelligence solutions uh, for public health, for any health practice. So in terms of education or yes, in the first for my generation, for example, of those doctors that didn't uh, have the solutions in the med school and now the new generations that are just starting the formation, what can we do? about that just in order to to have a better adoption of these new technologies what you're bringing up is a profound problem not just of course in mexico and the united states and everywhere is not um, moving with the times not uh, adapting to the major changes as you say digital sensors and how to deal with the data science and the ai and it's not in the curriculum of medical schools around the world. It's not right. It has to be changed. Uh, so I don't know how this is going to come about because we're, it goes back to what we talked about with the reluctance of the medical community to change, how it's yeah. sclerotic. Uh, it's almost ossified. And this is a problem we've had, you know, for many new parts of medicine as time goes on. It takes many years to see uh, the willingness to change, but it has to happen because this is an inevitable transformation and it's profound. It is the biggest change in medicine in my 35 years as a physician, by, without question, but the medical community has not uh, understood that yet. Of course, and I see the, the the evident challenges that we have there as a system, as a health system, as a community, but also in the personal path from for every professional health professional. So that's an important message for doctor. Thank you, doctor. The good before ending, and as I said at the beginning, most of the, our viewers are young health professionals from mostly from these regions, from Mexico and Latin America. What message would you like to give them today? Well, to me, the excitement, I wish I could go back now because this is going to be such a great time, a great era in medicine when we can get back the relationships with patients because patients will have more charge or autonomy and physicians will be relieved of the data clerk tasks that have really interfered with their ability to provide care and will be able to prioritize um, in-person visits to the important matters where we will have support by AI. There's no threat to this profession, this noble profession by AI. In fact, it's the, it's the rescue mode. It's gonna take this profession to another level, not just for accuracy, not, for, not just for relieving uh, the um, administrative duties that we don't want to, that interfere with our care, care of patients. But mostly my uh, aspiration is to see this restore the patient-doctor relationship. And that's why um, the people that are in practice, the young people today, they're so fortunate because they will see that uh, during their career. What well, an important message. Thank you, Professor. Uh, just the patient in the center and seeing the technology as a support as it is. I see. Doctor, Dr. thank you one more time for, for giving us this space. I mean, this is a, a, a short talk, but 
I believe we we are just starting reviewing these uh, important topics, and it's really I'm really glad that we have the, the experience that you we have right now. So thank you so much for this time, Professor. Mucho gracias. <laughs> Mucho gusto. And from please receive from all the team of the Mexican Society Political Labor we have best wishes uh, for you and for your team. And again, thank you very much for for your time your time and this opportunity to talk.